Now look at the tenderness and compassion of God. This is a moving section, so read it with, I mean, I'll read it here, but look at verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, that is, loved less than her sister, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Another trend, I mean, you can almost paraphrase it. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, the Lord loved her. That's the paraphrase. Verse 32, and Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. Okay, pause. We know Jacob's God is Rachel, and we know Rachel's God is having children that comes later. Leah's God is Jacob. Leah, the less loved wife, her God is her husband. And she says, God, now that I'm having a child, I'm able to ha- give my husband a child. Now my husband will love me. Do you see how she's, everything in her wants her husband. She was, she's thinking, if Jacob would just love me more than my sister, if he would just prefer me, then I'd be okay. Then I'd be satisfied. Then I would have all I needed. And yet it doesn't work. Verse 33, so she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, that is not loved by my husband, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And again she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore she called his name Levi. Now do you get, okay, I want everyone just to think about this for a second. She she idolizes her husband who doesn't seem to care much about her, right? And every time she has a son, she goes, now my husband's gonna be attached to me. Now my husband will be connected to me and love me. And each time it seems like it's not working because she keeps asking the same thing every time. And over and over we know Jacob to the day he died preferred Rachel, never Leah. And so Leah is in this broken state and her idol is not delivering. It's not giving her what she wants. It's not paying off what she needs. And so finally, this amazing moment happens with the fourth child, Judah. The Lord in his mercy has now broken her somewhat of her idol. And there's an amazing transformation. Look at this with me, verse 35. And Leah conceived again and bore this fourth son and said, this time... I will praise Yahweh, the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Do you see what happened? Her idol was not paying off, not paying off, not paying off. The fourth son, she goes, this time I'm finding my identity in the Lord. This time I'm praising the Lord. This time I'm rejoicing in the Lord, not in my husband. I'm no longer hoping in my husband. I'm hoping in the Lord. I'm no longer turning to my husband to give me meaning and significance. I am turning to the Lord. This time I will praise the Lord. And then she ceased bearing children. Let me just read to close the sermon an excerpt from uh, a a book by Tim Keller about this. Please just listen to this as as we close the message. This time I will praise the Lord. It appears that finally she had taken her heart's deepest hopes off of her husband and her children and had put them on the Lord. Jacob and Laban had stolen Leah's life, but when she gave her heart finally to the Lord, she got her life back. We shouldn't just look at what God did in her. We have to also look at what God did for her. Leah might have had a sense that there was something special about this last child. She may have had an intuition that God had done something for her, and he certainly had. This child was Judah. And in Genesis 49, we're told that through him, the true king, the Messiah, will one day come. God had come to the girl that nobody wanted, the unloved, and made her the ancestral mother of Jesus. Salvation came into the world, not through the beautiful Rachel, but through the unwanted one, the unloved one, Does God just like to root for the underdog? No. This wonderful gift to Leah meant far more than that. The text says that when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he loved her. God was saying, I am the real bridegroom. I am the husband to the husbandless. I am the father of the fatherless. This is the God who saves by grace. And then he says this. Leah's life points to her greater son. Listen to this. When God came to earth in Jesus Christ, he was truly the son of Leah. He became the man nobody wanted. 
He was born in a manger. He had no beauty that we should desire him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. And at the end, everybody abandoned him. Jesus cried out even to his father, why have you forsaken me? Why did he become Leah's son? Why did he become the man nobody wanted? For you and for me. He took upon himself our sins and died in our place. If we are deeply moved by the sight of his love for us, it detaches our hearts from other would-be saviors. We stop trying to redeem ourselves through our pursuits and relationships because we are already redeemed. We stop trying to make others into saviors because we have a savior. It's the last part. The only way to dispossess the heart of an old affection is by the expulsive power of a new and better one. How do you get rid of your idols? It's not by trying harder. You get this, right? You can't just choose to stop idolizing something. What you've got to do is you've got to uproot your idol and replace it. And the only way you can replace that idol is to find a greater joy, to find a greater God, to find a greater meaning. That's the only way we'll ever get victory over our sin is to replace our idols with the true God, to replace our false saviors with the true saviors, to, to replace our false counterfeits gods with the true God. Thus, it is not enough to hold out to the world the mirror of its own perfections. It's not enough to come forth with a demonstration of right behavior or to speak to the conscience. Rather, we must try every legitimate method of finding access to the hearts of our people for the love of him who is greater than the world. Jesus is the only Savior who, if you fail him, can forgive you. If you live for your job and you fail your job, and you lose your job, your job can't forgive you. You've lost your identity, it's over. If you're living for a spouse and your spouse leaves you or dies, that spouse can't come back, it can't be made right again, That's, that idol can't forgive you. If you're living for your children and your children don't turn out the way you want, you can't be forgiven of that. It's just, it's just you're stuck, you're trapped without an identity. Jesus is the only savior who when you fail him, he will forgive you completely, and when you trust him, he will love you fully, and only in Christ is our meaning, purpose, joy, and righteousness secure in him. Jesus is our greater Rachel.